Many years ago, when I was just 11 years old, my parents went away on some kind of work-related event. They were pharmacists working for the same company, so my brother and I had the house to ourselves. I also feel like I should add that my brother was 17 or 18 at the time and my parents deemed him old and responsible enough to take care of me. On the evening we were home alone, we got pizza and watched movies and had the best afternoon ever, along with our adorable German Shepherd dog, who was called Chaka. When it got dark, some boys from school showed up at our front gate calling for me. My brother stayed inside, peeking through the curtains as I went outside to greet them. I knew them well from school and was puzzled by their appearance since kids didn't usually go out in the neighborhood after dark. But soon, the reason for their visit became apparent. There was an older guy with them that immediately made me feel uncomfortable. He looked to be maybe 18 to 20 years old and was leaning up against our fence. The way he looked at me made my skin crawl, but one of the boys hurriedly said that it was one of his cousins and I should ignore him. When I asked what they wanted, they said that they wanted to show me something. I told them no, that it was late and that I wanted to stay inside. They then told me okay and that they'd leave if I did something for them. One of the boys then turned around and got something that he had hidden behind the lamppost. Then he returned with a brown bottle, filled with liquid with a label removed. It was already open when he told me to drink from it. I refused, but they just kept insisting that I drink saying it wasn't that strong, it tasted good, and that I'd be fine. My heart was beating in my chest, and I nervously played with the latch on the fence door. I just wanted them to leave, and I turned to give my brother a look, but he wasn't watching from the window anymore. Then suddenly, right when I thought that I might have been in some serious trouble, Chaka, our dog, appeared from behind me and planted his bottom on my feet. He was a very big dog, and this low, deep rumble started to grow louder and louder as he growled. He stared the guy down who hastily let go of the latch and backed away. The two boys also backed off quickly. It was as if Chaka sensed my fear and came to give me his strength. He would fight for me. I told them to go away and leave. I didn't want to drink their stuff. My dog sat like a statue on my feet until they disappeared back into the darkness. My brother said that he was watching the entire time for any signs of trouble and couldn't believe how brave Chaka had been, but I knew that wasn't true. If it wasn't for Chaka, things might have gotten far, far worse with the boys. When my dad heard about it, he gave Chaka a big stake as a reward. Chaka was my guardian angel. I still love and think of him as he passed in 2008. He was starting to go gray around his mouth when my story happened and loved snoozing on the kitchen floor. Whenever I was alone at home, Chaka would follow me all around the house. He would even escort me to the bathroom or relax in the doorway with his eyes always watching the front door. He had a good long life and was an amazing friend. We all still love him dearly, but I feel like my experience that evening made it so I loved him a little bit more than the rest of my family. A few years ago, I was working at a pizza chain in my hometown as a driver. I was 27 but made darn good money delivering. I had worked at a few other places, both local and chain in the years before, and still work as a dasher on occasion even after this happened. Now I choose to deliver in much safer areas for this reason. I get luckier than I could ever imagine. One night I was working and had a double, two deliveries to take, and both were cash orders. I had $12 left in my bank, what drivers are given to use as change for cash orders so you don't have a ton of cash on you at all times. The first order went smoothly, the guy gave me a 50 for a $35 order so I was excited about the nice tip. I drove to the second delivery, it was at an apartment complex with multiple buildings. I had delivered there before, the sun was about to set but it was still very light out. The chain I worked at had us drive company cars with a logo on it, all white sedans. This is important. I grab the order and go to the door to the apartment building. A younger guy comes out and a much bigger older guy was outside smoking a cigarette. The big guy went inside as the smaller guy came out. He looked around nervously and asked how much he owed me. The way he was looking around just made me very nervous. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I told him the amount and he said that wasn't what he was told on the phone. Something was very wrong. 
I felt someone else walk out behind me from the door as the first young guy looked around the parking lot, craning his neck as if he was looking for someone. I told him the amount again and broke down the order for him trying to keep calm. Then the first guy held a gun right to my temple. I also felt a poke on my spine. Two gunmen. I couldn't speak. Words wouldn't form no matter how hard I tried. Give me your money and your keys. Now. The first guy growled and I fumbled immediately for the keys. I gave him my bank but hadn't realized the 50 was mixed in. I gave him the keys trying my best to remain calm. Another guy came up from my left. He had poofy hair and was around the same age as the first kid. The one behind me I hadn't seen yet. The big haired kid grabbed the pizza bag and ran off and hid. The first kid searched the company car and luckily I had left my wallet in my personal car. I saw him grab my cell phone, and that's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on that phone that I hadn't backed up of my then five-year-old son, who was absolutely my world. Please, please don't take that. I got pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him. Please. No, I was lying. My son is very much alive. The kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, just listen to him. You'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell he'd been crying by how his voice sounded. The car began pulling in and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in a full sprint. Before the one behind me ran, he dropped the gun in front of me, a standard issue 9mm silver and black. The safety was off and it looked completely real to me. He picked it back up and ran with the others. The car that pulled in saw me. It was a woman and her kid, and panic set in as I realized that they could easily come back and do way worse to me as the sky started to get dark. I collapsed. They had taken my company car keys, $72, the pizza, and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked if I was alright. She took me into her apartment in the next building over and locked the door. I was shaking so hard I couldn't even hold her phone to talk to 911 as she set down her kid. Her boyfriend, I assumed, helped me call. I spoke to the operator and told her everything. I'm colorblind and these guys were obviously wearing all black and white clothes, thank god. I had a full description of two of them, and the poor woman who helped me was going to be late for work, but she still stayed until I was off the phone and the cops had shown up. Man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator, but I'll never forget this woman's utter kindness to me and her boyfriends. Cops showed up and contacted my store and my manager brought over the spare keys for me to drive that car back to the store. And after dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by crying and beyond worried co-workers. All of them were terrified that I was hurt. It meant a lot to me how much they cared, but I told them I was fine. I filed the proper paperwork, and the 72 was written off as a loss to the store. Thank God, because I had worked other stores that may you pay back the money out of pocket if you get robbed to prevent drivers from stealing. I was told by the owner to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself. He gave me a hug, and he was to this day one of the best bosses I've ever had. What I didn't know was, I was in for a very long night. I called my best friend before I left the store from the store phone and asked where he was. We usually meet up for drinks after work. He was around the corner at a bar, so I met up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, the same district that this happened in. He told me his dad had given him a heads up and he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. After the two shots, we began playing pool when his dad called his phone and asked if I was with him yet. He said yeah and handed me the phone. His dad asked if I could come to the station. I was honest and told him that I had two shots, so he sent out a squad car to get me since it wasn't that far away. We get to the station, and they had suspects in custody, and I was needed to ID them. Three boys and a driver. They've been caught less than 20 minutes after the robbery, speeding. The bee on the lookout had already gone out, and they matched the description. They had used the money to buy weed and gas and had taken off. They had at least 15 stolen cell phones on them. The order had been placed on a stolen phone, and my phone was in the mix in the box. The police told me to grab my phone only, and I did, and they asked me to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification, so that was easy. None of the ten tries to unlock it had already been used before my phone would have completely reset. It unlocked, 
I told the police every detail yet again, although my parental instincts kicked in. I told them the guy behind me quite obviously was bullied into this and to show mercy, and he was the one with the white shirt. The police went wide-eyed and told me he was the one talking. The other three denied involvement, and that's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. We found out later that he was completely unaware of the robbery and was just picking up his friends, and he was never charged. The boy who was behind me and the one who grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and got six months of house arrest. The only reason the one behind me got off easy despite having the gun to my back was because I asked them to go easy on him and that he was a good kid who didn't want to be there, and he was the only one confessing. Makes sense since he had said that the other guys wouldn't have the phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops had they not been caught, but the other guy, the first kid who put the gun to my temple, it was his 18th birthday, and he got the book thrown at him. In the courtroom, he made fun of me and was laughing at me, and seeing him made me panic. The judge scolded him for his behavior and he just grinned and glared at me with a joker-like grin, and all I could see in his eyes was pure evil. This kid would definitely commit more crimes. I had no doubt that he would eventually end someone's life. You can see how cold he is just by looking in his eyes. He's evil incarnate. I grew up in a town full of murders and abusers, and I had never seen this kind of evil in my life, and I never want to see it again. I asked to have my name stricken from the records and asked to remain anonymous in case he ever got out. And I'm so glad I did because today I got a letter from the state. He's being released in February. The court only had my old address, my parents' house, my mom didn't think the letter was important. I missed the deadline to protest his release for probation. The plea deal was eight years and it's only been four. He's getting out early due to overcrowding. Not good behavior. Overcrowding and this coming February, and I'm ready if he finds me. My wife, my parents, everyone I know knows his face and name. If he tries anything, we're all ready. But for his sake, let's not meet. And to the woman in her family who helped me, I was a woman then. I'm trans now, and if you see this, please know my undying gratitude for you all. It was inconvenient for you, and yet you still were late to work to help me, and I cannot thank you enough. I bought Christmas presents for your daughter, but when I went to the landlord there to find you, you had moved. I didn't want to be a creep and stalk your new place, but I'm glad you got out of that bad neighborhood, and I hope your beautiful baby girl is doing well. I would gladly meet you again and give you the proper thanks you deserve. From the Domino's Driver in Southwest Ohio. I just got back from a family vacation in Los Cabos, Mexico. We stayed at a nice western resort and usually at around 9.30pm, my family would head back to their rooms to go to sleep. Naturally, as a 25 year old, I wanted to stay up and party or go drinking at bars, but my older brother was working remotely and wouldn't go out with me. After the family went to bed, I went out to a bar around the corner from my hotel and ended up befriending the locals there and a 29 year old guy from San Diego named Luke. It was there for a wedding. We started hanging out every night after my family went to sleep and on the third night of the trip, Luke asked if I wanted to meet him in downtown Los Cabos with his friends. I really wanted to, but I was at an important dinner with my family that went on later than usual. I ended up staying at home that night. The next night, I met him at this huge Pablo Escobar-esque mansion that they rented on Airbnb and he told me that it was good that I couldn't make it out the night before because of how scary of an experience it was. He explained to me that the night before his buddy was peeing outside and someone approached him and held out a key with a bump of coke on it. Without thinking, he snorted the bump and the person who offered it was now demanding that he buy an $80 bag from them. He was drunk and refused while getting pretty aggressive towards them. Things went from bad to worse as the Mexican who offered the bum started following their group from bar to bar for the next three hours, taking pictures of them. He called his friends and there were now a group of them following behind and claiming to be affiliated with the cartel. They warned that if Luke's buddy didn't pay them, that they were going to call their boss. Luke eventually went over and tried to smooth things over. They told him his friends had stolen from them and that it was going to cost him his life if someone didn't pay up. 
The cartel member also pulled his shirt up, revealing a 9mm pistol in his waistband. Luke did the right thing and remained calm while offering to take them to an ATM to pay out of pocket, $160 US, so they could all be left alone. The cartel members gave him an empty coke bag and abruptly left. Even after doing all of this for his friend's safety, his friend denied any responsibility or wrongdoing and even had the audacity to blame Luke for trying to help by getting involved. He also didn't offer Luke a single dollar. After this event happened, Luke got robbed again in the same night, with a girl who ripped his $200 gold necklace right off his neck. His friend was cool to me, but sounded like a real jerk after Luke explained this to me. Poor dude was just trying to be a good friend and was met with no gratitude, only to be robbed again. Needless to say, I'm very happy that I didn't make it out to meet them that night. I also think that things could have gotten a lot worse for them had he not offered the cartel members money. Be careful out there, and never accept free drugs from strangers on the street of Mexico, or really anywhere. It always comes with a price. For context, I didn't grow up in a good area. I won't give location for privacy's sake, but I live in a fairly large city, and at the time, I was around 10 or 11. This was overall not a good area. Lots of gang activity, drug use, that kind of thing. One of those neighborhoods with the jacked up sidewalks and shopping carts strewn everywhere. There was a park a couple of blocks away from my house and I decided to go on a run and spend some time there on my own. I don't know why I was allowed to leave on my own, knowing the area. It was still light out when I jogged down there, but it started getting dark when I actually reached the park. It was around dusk. The layout of the park was a big rectangle, basically. It faced out long ways, so the shorter side was where the gate was. There was a set of swings at the very front, and I sat down to hang out there a bit. At the time, I didn't have a phone with service, I just had music downloaded to listen to it. I was sitting with my earbuds in, and just got this really awful feeling. It felt like a tingling on my back, and I knew something was up. I took one earbud out and kept swinging, but I couldn't shake that feeling. Finally, I turned around to check behind me. There was an alleyway leading into the park that curved so you could only see part of the way down. It was all white gravel. Down the alley was a dumpster, and there was a figure on the ground with a ton of red stuff around him, which I now know was blood, and another guy standing, walking fast towards me. The alley was across the playground, about 40 feet away maybe, and as soon as I saw the man approaching me, I just dipped out of there. He had something in his hand that I couldn't see, but he was holding it like a knife or a pair of scissors. I sprinted the couple of blocks back to my house and got in through the back to make sure no one saw me. I didn't tell my dad until years later and he fully believed me. That area was bad news and I'm amazed something bad didn't happen to me with how much I was let out alone. On my 19th birthday in September 2014, I moved into my first home, a small one-bed flat. I was beyond excited to have the freedom and independence that living alone would offer me and quickly set about buying new furniture, decorations, and items for my home. One afternoon on the bus home after a trip into my local town to buy more household items, an elderly gentleman in his late 60s, if I had to guess, started speaking to me. I've always been a social person that'll gladly speak to whoever speaks to me, so I engaged him in the conversation. Just polite chit-chat about what we've been up to that day, what our plans were for the rest of it. Upon reaching the stop that I'd be getting off at, he told me that he also was getting off at the stop as he was visiting a friend who lived in a neighboring block of flats. He offered to help me carrying my shopping, and I agreed. I walked with him on the front of my block and said my goodbyes. He left towards a different block, and I thought that was that. He didn't enter my building or see which flat belonged to me, or so I thought. A few days later, I heard a knock upon my door. I opened it to find the same elderly gentleman standing outside my door. I was quite taken aback considering that he shouldn't know which flat I actually lived in. He also managed to get into the building without ringing my doorbell. The realization hit me that he must have hidden out of sight to watch which flat that I entered. The block had large windows in the communal area. 
He quickly forced his way into my home and tried talking to me. I lied and stated that I was about to leave as my friends were expecting me, hoping that this would encourage him to go. He then started groping me under my clothes and underwear. He moved his hands away, but he kept trying to remove my clothes. I ran to my front door and told him, I I'm leaving now, you need to go. Luckily he did, but loitered. I waited to make sure that he'd walked away before walking in an opposite direction and immediately calling my dad, and I was in tears. We rang the police, who were as unhelpful as they could possibly be, two female officers who asked me, why did you let him into the flat, despite me saying that he forced his way in. They encouraged me not to press charges as the name and address he'd given me in our first exchange was falsified, telling me it would be difficult to prove a lot of paperwork and you have to relive it in court if we did manage to find him. And I regretfully agreed. I was shocked and scared and the police already were so unsupportive. And it doesn't end there though. This man continued to stalk me for months, regularly appearing at my door, following me when I was out, and it wasn't until he was on the same bus as me to town when I went to meet friends that it finally stopped, as this was the first time I was able to point him out to someone. My friends went over and publicly called him out for stalking and harassing me. They threatened him, saying, If we ever hear of you doing this again, you'll not be able to use those arms to abuse another person. You leave our friend alone. He quickly scampered away, and that's the last I ever saw of him. But this incident shook me. It all happened simply because I was polite to a seemingly innocent elderly man who wanted to help me and make conversation. Needless to say, I've never accepted another offer of helping me carry my shopping. Be careful who you let help you. It might not be good intentions they have in mind. We've all had bad dates, right? This is the only date I've had to this point that rang every alarm bell and waved every red flag. I'll preface this by saying that I don't go on many dates, but when I do, I make sure I follow safety protocol by only meeting my date in public places. Let either family or friends know where I'm going and park in a populated place close by to wherever we meet. Anyway, this date initially suggested that we meet at his house to watch a movie and have a few drinks and I said no, I don't feel comfortable with that and I only want to meet in public. He seemed okay with this, but then brought it up a few more times and said if money is an issue, we can meet up another time or forget about it altogether. But my date backtracked and went with my idea of meeting at a cafe that I chose, that I was familiar with and equidistant to where we both lived. Anyway, he turns up in a two-door car, this detail is relevant, and goes into the cafe and I follow behind and introduce myself. After a polite introduction, things begin to get weird. I ordered a Coke and he says, Don't you want a drink? I was going to pop into the bar, which is connected to the cafe, and get one. I say no, I'm not drinking, and he looks at me like WTF, as if though I'm being unreasonable. I already explained in messages that I don't drink as I'm on medication, so having to re-explain it again started to make me angry. He seems disappointed and goes to order a cider from the bar while I get a table. Anyway, we sit down with our drinks and the date immediately goes on about back to his place again even though the original plan was to stay here and order food and I already stated that that was not happening. He says something along the lines of having a few drinks and eating at his place and I said we don't have to eat we can just have our drinks and leave. He gets defensive and says he has money but prefers if we go back to his. I make a joke and say, you're not a killer are you? And instead of laughing it off, he stares at me uncannily and says, You don't think I would hurt you, do you? I laugh uncomfortably and say, Of course not, but really I'm relieved this date won't be going any further. The date suddenly says, Are you going to follow me in your car? Because that wouldn't make sense. How about we just go in my car, but I got packages in the front, so you'll have to squeeze in the back, and I'll drop you back off of your car after. In reality, that made less sense than me following his car and driving home from his house. The fact that it was completely illogical made it even more creepy in my mind. Every alarm bell was going off at this point, and I said, Look, I don't want to go to yours, and your insistence is giving me the creeps. Date looks shocked, 
mumbles something about needing the toilet and excuses himself from the table. A few moments later, I see him through the cafe window getting into his car and driving off. Massive bullet dodged in my opinion. Also, the fact his car didn't have back doors made it even more sinister because imagine if something happened in the car and I couldn't escape. This happened five years ago and I'm only posting now because I want to warn others. This is quite difficult to talk about and for reasons that will become clear. In 2017, I went to a friend's birthday. It was their 40th birthday, so it was a pretty big deal. I had recently lost my job and I was struggling with my mental health, but I had a very supportive husband and a good family life. And it was a private party. What could go wrong? My husband was supposed to go with me, but our childcare arrangements fell through at the last moment. I didn't want to go without my husband, but he felt I needed a night out with friends, and the birthday girl kept asking if I was coming, so I went. It was a private party and everyone there had been invited by the birthday girl. There was a half dozen people that I knew really well. Everyone else was a stranger but I assumed that the birthday girl had good judgement and everyone present was okay. We were all having a great time, laughing and dancing and at one point I stepped outside to cool down and smoke a cigarette. A fellow party goer, a male, joined me and we talked about the birthday girl, how we knew her and we talked about football and it turned out that we were from the same city and supported the same team. We returned to the party and he asked me if I wanted a drink. I said no and raised my glass to show him that I already had one. I then put my drink down and went to dance with my friend. When I returned from the dance floor, I took a big gulp of my drink and after that, it all gets a little hazy. And the rest of the story is pieced together from various sources and photos. There is a photo of the male party guests and me with the venue's door staff. I'm smiling at the camera with my arm around the security man and the male party guest next to me kissing my cheek. I don't remember this. There is a photo of me and that person. I'm leaning against him with my eyes closed and I don't remember this. And I woke up the next morning at home, on the sofa. My husband was initially furious about the state that I came home in but he didn't know how bad it could have been. Apparently several friends saw the male party guest trying to guide me into a waiting car and stopped him. When they challenged him, he said I had agreed to leave with him but I was incoherent at this point and I have no recollection of this by the way. A female friend, N, took me home and I don't remember this but I know my friend saved me from something obviously horrible. Once my husband knew what had happened, he was very supportive and concerned. N told my husband how quickly my behavior had changed and how quickly I had become uncoordinated and incoherent. And this all took place five years ago. I saw my friend recently and she told me that that male party goer is currently in prison for assaulting his girlfriend in 2020. Please remember, always be careful with your drink, never leave it unattended. Watch out for your friends and make sure they're watching out for you. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I stopped quickly at a Safeway on my way home from work. As I was walking back to my car, I saw a couple walking a fluffy white husky dog, a big dog, and in my head I marveled at how fluffy the dog was, as I love dogs. I got to my car and as I was climbing in, I heard a female voice say something unintelligible. I glanced around, saw the guy who had his dog standing behind the car next to me, which struck me as odd and a little disconcerting. I hit the door lock button immediately. I started my car and as I did I noticed a girl standing on my passenger side peering into my window, her mouth moving, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. She clearly wanted me to roll down the window. Oh no. No, 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 no. Oh god, no. Not a chance. I've watched way too many true crime shows to even consider this and do you know how many women go missing from grocery store parking lots? Neither do I, but based on what I've watched, a whole lot. I made eye contact for a half a second, shook my head sternly and put my car into gear. I reversed out of the spot, careful not to hit her, but while also completely ignoring her as she got more and more distraught, waving her arms and flailing at my car. She was wearing pajamas from what I could see and getting more and more upset at me ignoring her. 
Her partner remained in the shadows with the dog, seemingly unaware that I had already clocked him and was watching him too. There was a tiny part of my brain asking, what if she needed help? And a much bigger part of my brain that said, nope. If they needed help, they can go in the store and ask them to call 911. Also, there were two of them and only one of me. I'm outnumbered, plus they have a huge dog. Why in God's name would they ask a small, young, lone woman in a parking lot for help unless they had some sort of nefarious intentions? My mind went to drugs, maybe, and I'm almost certain that they would be asking for money or a ride somewhere, even more sketchy, or some form of assistance, and nah, not having it. I am under no obligation to help anyone, and neither are you, especially a stranger. Also, you know what? I've helped plenty of people today. I've helped people under careful, cautious observation. I work as a caregiver in a nursing home. If you're approaching a young woman in a dark parking lot at 10.30 at night, I sincerely doubt you contribute anything positive to my life, and I owe you absolutely nothing. Mama ain't Ray's no fool. Back in 2019... I, an 18-year-old female, decided to download Tinder a few months after a rough breakup. I was very inexperienced with dating and pretty shy, so it seemed unlikely that I would meet a potential partner in person. Anyway, after a few matches that really led to nothing, I came across the profile of someone that I found very attractive. It was a 21-year-old male. We matched, exchanged Snapchats, and continued to set up a date. Our first date was relatively normal and enjoyable. We saw a movie and by the end of it I felt like we hit it off. However, our relationship was extremely short-lived. Not long after, I had agreed to be his girlfriend, about a month after going out, and he began to behave very erratically and would sometimes fall completely silent in the middle of conversation, ignoring me when I tried to ask him what was wrong. He became hot-tempered, slamming doors and speeding on the road when he was mad. I started to feel really uncomfortable about our relationship. This went on for about a few weeks until one night when we were on our way to have dinner downtown, he felt silent mid-conversation. I became extremely anxious as he pulled into a nearby parking garage wondering what I had done to upset him. As we parked, I decided to ask him what was wrong. He didn't answer. When I asked him again, he shouted at me to shut up. I was completely frozen for a moment, but I finally got up the courage to tell him that we were done gathered my belongings from the car and walked over to the nearest coffee shop to call an Uber. It was fairly late at night, so I walked as fast as I could, hoping that he wouldn't follow me. When I made it to the shop, I noticed that I had several missed calls from him. When I made it home that night, I blocked him on all social media and decided never to contact him again. I'm fairly familiar with the dynamic of toxic relationships and I knew that if he could talk to me that way, completely unprompted, it was likely that he was capable of much more. About a week goes by as I start to settle my emotions a bit. I decided to confide in a friend who had never met the guy about what happened, feeling completely embarrassed. A few nights later, I received a text from the same friend. It was a screenshot of an Instagram DM from someone she didn't follow, my now ex. It said something to the effect of, Hey, I'm sorry we're having to meet like this, but redacted is ignoring me and I needed to talk to her. My heart sunk. I decided to message all my friends separately and let them know what happened, just in case. Later that week I started receiving several DMs from various accounts, all without profile pictures or posts. Eventually, I gave in and responded to one, asserting that the relationship was over and that I didn't want to hear from him again. I blocked the accounts immediately afterwards. As time went on, without hearing a word in weeks, I figured that I had reached the end of the situation, until one morning while I was walking to my car, I noticed something dangling around the handle of my car door. It was a necklace I gave him. He had only picked me up once from my house before, and the thought of him driving to my house about a half hour from his place earlier that night freaked me out. I was shaken up for a while. It was by no means an expensive necklace, and I had the exact same one, but I kept it. I thought maybe it was his way of acknowledging that we were done. Two months later, I was working my job at a small boutique near my house. I was used to answering the phone several times a day, so when the phone rang, I thought nothing of it. But when I picked it up, I immediately recognized his voice. 
He started rambling about wanting a sweatshirt back, but I hung up before he could finish. And that was the last time I would ever tell someone I was dating where I worked. I was completely lost at this point, especially considering that he had never called me at work while we were together. I didn't even know how he knew that I was working that day and time. I told my older sister the situation and she, being very protective, decided to message him herself. She told him to leave me alone and even offered to give him back the sweatshirt for me. He refused and insisted on meeting up with me in person to get it. When it became abundantly clear that he didn't actually want the sweatshirt back, she threatened him with a PPO to which he never responded, and that was the last time I heard from him. I'm not sure how to start this story, so I'm just going to go ahead with it. My boyfriend, a 20-year-old male, and I, a 21-year-old female, live alone and we both work weird hours. He leaves for work at around 10.30pm and I leave around 4am. It started to get cold outside and I drive a 30-year-old Honda, so it takes a while to warm up. One morning, I went outside at around 3.45am to start my car so it would be warmed up by the time I was leaving for work. When I went outside to start my car, there was nobody else outside and no other cars that I could see besides the one parked in my neighbor's driveways. There was not a car parked in front of my house. Then at 4am it was time for me to leave. I got all my stuff ready and was walking to my car and as I'm walking I hear a man yell, hey. I ignored it because obviously it's 4am and dark outside and I'm a female, I don't know. But I noticed his car was parked directly in front of my house which is honestly weird to me by itself. So then again he yelled hey, but it was a bit louder this time. I still refused to even look in that direction and pretended I didn't hear him. He yelled over and over again, hey can I get a jump? Asking me to jump his car. He kept getting louder each time and seemed like he was starting to get frustrated. At this point all I was thinking was this guy was not here 15 minutes ago. How did he suddenly pull up and his car died conveniently right in front of my house all within 15 minutes. So anyway, I continued to pretend that I didn't hear him, got in my car and immediately locked the doors and left. As I was driving away, I kept my eyes on the mirrors and when I got about a block and a half away, I saw his car start up and he drove away completely fine. It didn't look like he needed a jump at all. So why was he asking me for a jump if his car could start up just fine? What would have happened if I actually did try to go help? I could be overreacting, but to me the whole situation seems suspicious. My grandma always said that a man would never ask a woman for help, especially with a car. And my boyfriend said one time that he wouldn't even approach a female at night just for the simple fact that it made them uncomfortable. I told him what happened, and he said it was weird as well. I don't know if it could have been a trafficking tactic, kidnapping tactic, all that kind of stuff, but it was definitely strange. One of my friends joked that someone could be watching my house, and... I get that they were trying to be funny and lighten the mood, but it's definitely kind of scary when you have an experience like that, especially because if someone was watching my house, they would know that I was completely alone for hours at night. Do you have any thoughts? I'm still trying to wrap my head around this and figure out if I'm overreacting or not, and this was just a few nights ago, and honestly, i am been kind of scared going out to my car or just being alone in general at night since. We moved into a suburban house in the southern US a few years back. When the pandemic hit, I found myself working remotely. It was great since I spent more time with my family and didn't have to spend two hours in traffic. However, being home a majority of my week exposed me and my family to a variety of strange encounters that have only escalated through the years. Early in the pandemic, we got a knock on the door mid-morning. I was in a meeting, but I heard my partner open the door. I could tell by the voice that it was our next door neighbor, an older woman who lived alone. She was in the process of moving and had stopped by every day or so to give us a few odds and ends that she didn't want to take with her. However, within a few seconds, my partner called my name with a worried tone. I excused myself from the meeting and head over to our landing which is open to the front door below. Both my partner and the neighbor looked slightly panicked. The neighbor says that there's a strange man sitting on our back wall. What do we do? Now for context, my house is on a greenbelt. 
There's about 500 yards of woods and field until you hit a four-lane road and small shopping plaza. Our back wall is smooth, made of concrete, and about six and a half feet high. The ground on the greenbelt side is slope, which ends up making the wall about seven feet high on the greenbelt side. A taller person with considerable effort could probably scale it. I initially think that there's no way someone is up on that wall right now, but sure enough, as I run downstairs and look through the back sliding glass door, there's a middle-aged man smoking a cigarette, with both feet hanging into my yard. He's kind of lazily staring at the back of mine and my neighbor's houses, and my adrenaline starts to kick in. My kids swing set and toys are in the backyard. I hate confrontation, but I seem to be automatically moving to open the back door. My partner asks what I'm doing. I open the door and step out into the porch and start walking across the yard. As I'm getting closer, I can tell the guy is bugging and probably homeless. He notices me when I get about six feet from him. I'm trying to stay calm and not escalate things. Hey man, what are you doing up there? He gestures around him. Uh, enjoying my view? I interrupt. Yeah, you, you gotta get down and go somewhere else, man. He just kind of stares at me and swings a leg over the side but stays put. Just please get off my property. I say more forcefully this time, trying to hide my wavering in my voice. Yeah, yeah, okay. He slides the other leg around and jumps down, disappearing from view. I never saw this person again, thankfully. Now a few months later, I'm working from home. My partner and kids are gone, so I'm alone. There's a knock at the door. Usually I ignore them unless I'm expecting someone, and most of the time it's either Amazon or a solicitor. They usually knock once and then take off. However, this person leans on the doorbell and knocks again. Annoyed, I leave the office to go see who it is. I make my way to the door and can hear a muffled conversation taking place on the other end before I can look through the peephole. I look and see four people all dressed like they're heading to a business lunch. Two men in their mid-twenties, an older man, and a young woman towards the back that couldn't have been more than 20 to 21. I slowly open the door out of curiosity and the older man immediately gets uncomfortably close and starts speaking forcefully in a language I don't understand. It takes my brain a moment to catch up. Uh, I can't understand what I start saying. And he pauses and asks in English, You can't speak Russian? No. Then there's a long moment where we all just kind of stare at each other and he looks like he doesn't believe me, glaring. Where's the nearest Russian church? He asks, while the others stand silently behind him. I have no clue. I genuinely have no idea if such things exist in the southern United States. He thanks me, and then they all walk back to their nondescript sedan and take off. They did not stop at any of their houses on the street. A few years back, I was living with my aunt and uncle after moving to a new state. They had just moved into a new home and a new suburb development. In this area, door-to-door -door salesmen swarm new developments and new builds for water softeners, cleaning supplies, solar panels, generators, and the Kirby vacuum people. They wandered the neighborhood all day knocking on doors, but were usually gone by around 5 p.m. This particular evening, I was home alone with my dog a mutt who was mostly black lab and an unknown mixture. It was roughly the size and weight of a full-breed Labrador, but he had a stockier build and long, wiry hair. He was a gentle, sweet baby who was upset if someone spoke harshly to him, and I'd never known him to be threatening to anyone. My aunt and uncle were out celebrating their anniversary. This time of the year, the days were getting longer, and we would have full dark by around 8 p.m., it was about 7 p.m. and starting to get dusky when someone rang the doorbell and knocked on the door. The door was one of those with thick glass oval windows and I could see the door and who was there from the kitchen. I was going to ignore them but unfortunately they could see me and continued to knock so I went to answer the door. My dog followed me but stood off to the side in the shadows of the dining room. The person at the door was a young man about college age dressed in a collared shirt and tie and khakis. He looked a bit like a Mormon missionary person, and he was thin and about my height, about 5'9". 
I figured that he was a salesman of some sort, but thought it was odd that he was out this late in the day. I thought I'd open the door a crack, tell him that I'm not interested, and then lock the door again. I open the door a few inches to speak through it, and he starts to spiel about Kirby vacuum cleaners, and he wants to come in and give a demo. One, this is not my house. And two, I know once they get in, they aren't leaving without selling something, and I have no need for an overpriced vacuum, and I don't have a thousand dollars to spend anyway. I tell him, no thanks, I'm not interested, and begin to close the door when he puts his foot between the door and the door jam and throws his hand up to stop the door from closing. This is when I'm thinking, what is happening? And I hear a vicious growling behind me and to my right, and then a loud, deep bark, bark, bark as my dog lunges for the door. I grab his collar to keep him from going out the door, and the guy's mouth drops open. His eyes get really wide, and he looks like he's ready to pass out or pee himself as he jumps back from the door and backs away, saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, R wrong house, wrong house, and then turns and runs to the end of the driveway where a car with three men in it pulls up to get him and they speed off, tires literally squealing. I told my aunt and uncle about it when they got home, and we told a few neighbors so they could keep an eye out for any unusual behavior. It's possible that they were a team of Kirby salesmen. They do travel in teams of four, I guess, and follow the door knockers in the car with a vacuum, but I was suspicious because it was late in the day for them to be knocking on doors, and it was a team of four men. Usually they have a team with two or more women in the group because they are knocking on the doors at a time of day when women are going to be home alone and unlikely to let strange men in. So, a team of Kirby salesmen working late at night quotas or a team of home invaders? I don't know, but I'm just thankful that Cosmo, my dog, wasn't going to take chances. My entire primary school experience felt like a fever dream, but I don't think I could fit it all in a post, so instead, I'm choosing to tell the most bizarre experience in my schooling life. In my school, the language sub that I was taking had teachers leaving almost every three months. Some due to finding a job with higher wages. This teacher, however, left due to a very disturbing attitude towards kids, 8 to 10. This teacher is Mr. John. He came to our school during the second semester of grade 5, my class. He was not only a language teacher, but a PE and arts teacher as well, despite not having any experience in either fields. At first, he made a good impression, cracking jokes and giving helpful advice. However, one day, he started deferring to very mature topics while he was teaching. He would talk about paintings, but somehow divert the conversation to body odor and what kind of object that would emit such terrible smells such as excrement. He would go too much into detail about excrement, nothing you learn from bio, to the point where it's not funny but kind of disturbing. He later talked about puberty, which at first seems normal, but later talked about how puberty changes your such and such body parts and other feelings you get. We were eight and he then showed pictures of his ex-girlfriend when she was 17 and her selfies. She was getting married, and he had her photos in a file on his computer. The final blow was him taking off his shirt and showing every scar and injury that was inflicted on him, and he forced us all to look at them. We were so uncomfortable. Finally, I complained to the principal along with a few others, and he tried to find those who complained about him. He asked around and interrogated two of my friends, and... Thankfully, he was let go. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, the big red sack isn't always full of presents.